praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Welcome to church. Happy to be in church today. I'm happy to be in church. I'm happy to be here with all of you and to welcome you all. Um, I don't know what it is about me, but every time I preach, that clock's not working. <laughs> and I'm very conscious of time, like, because I don't want to go over time. And every time I have to go and ask Martin if I can borrow his watch, because the nickel watches um, irritate me, so I borrow Martin's watch. It was the same thing when I gave birth to Sophie, my, um, my second daughter. And, you know, I was so proud of myself. I got to the hospital. I was nearly quite getting near to giving birth. And they took me to room opposite Big Ben at St. Thomas's Hospital. And uh, I was there with Mike, and she went away, the, the midwife. And I kept saying to Mike, what's the time now? What's the time now? What's the time now? And we kept looking at the clock at Big Ben, and it was still the same time. And I'm like, this is crazy. It can't be. But, you know, that night, a very rare thing occurred. Big Ben broke down. So, uh, you know, perhaps next time, you know, don't go and uh, have a baby in St. Thomas's Hospital, just in case. Big Ben breaks down. But for me, I don't know what it is. The clocks always seem to stand still. Now, that could be a bad thing for you, because it could mean if I'm not aware of time, that I go on and on and on and on. But let's hope that I don't. So, praise God. Amen. Um, I was really blessed today. Our sister Beth brought the pastoral, and her word fits in perfectly with what I believe God has given us as a church for our word for this coming year, from this Passover time. And uh, the word for this year, we can put up slide one, it says, incline your ear. Incline your ear. And it might sound very basic and not like, wow, we're going to massive breakthrough, you know. But you know, I believe this is absolutely the most important word that we could ever hear. Because if you get to the place where you are in open heaven with God, and God is continually speaking to you, there will be absolute transformation. Amen. In your life, in this nation, in your family, in your situation, when you are getting that open heaven and you're communicating with God and He's able to speak and direct you in a supernatural way, revolutionizes everything. Everything will change. You know, one of the biggest um, requests that people get, uh, that leaders get, is can you pray with me because I need direction. I need to know what job I should go to. I need to know where I should be. I need to know how I can go about getting a breakthrough in this certain situation. And people come for direction. But you know, I think, I understand that we need times when people pray with us. But I believe this scripture in John 10, 27. It says, the sheep, John 10, 27. It says, my sheep that are my own, hear my voice. My sheep that are my own, they will hear my voice. I know them. And they follow me. Do you know what I believe absolutely that God wants to get us to a place where we are so in touch with his word, so hearing from him. It's abnormal if you're in a family, say me and Mike, and I have to keep going to someone else and say, excuse me, can you tell me what my husband wants to say to me? You're supposed to be living together. You're supposed to be family. And if you're not talking... There's a reason that that's happening, but it's not normal. God said, my sheep, they hear my voice, they listen to me, and that I know them, and they follow me. But you know what? So often, we can be listening, but we're not hearing. We can be listening, but we're not hearing. Yeah. Sometimes you can sit and listen to a preaching, and you can be looking there, but it's going right over your head. Pastor Johnny, last time he preached, he said, you know, I'd rather you didn't come forward and answer an appeal. I'd rather that what I've said that came alive in your life. And it won't come. No, everyone's going to be scared in case they're falling asleep, aren't they? <laughs> but you know what? When something's being said, you can hear it. Sorry, you can listen to it. 
but you don't always hear it. There's a big difference between listening and hearing. Sometimes I'm driving, sometimes there's music playing, or I'm listening to the Bible on, on the, on the, on the uh, device. We used to have a CD, we don't have a CD anymore. Um, you know, but sometimes I'm getting conscious of what I'm doing driving. Sometimes I'm conscious when I'm driving. So it's a good thing. So, but you're watching driving and you, you've got the music on, but you're not hearing it. You're not hearing what's playing because your mind's elsewhere. But you can hear it, but you're not, you can listen to it, but you're not hearing it. Um, slide number three, there's, this thing was said, it says there's a lot of difference between listening and hearing. Because when you are listening, it's about being present. You're not just being quiet. Listening is about being present. So when we listen, things can go over our heads. But when we hear, that is when we are hearing and knowing what is being said. And sometimes I think God wants to speak to us and we're listening but we're not hearing. That's why it says incline your ear. But sometimes you have to work on that. Sometimes you have to work on concentration. Sometimes you can be studying for an exam and you read and read and read and it's just not going in. But this year is going to be our year to get our ears working because God is speaking because we're a family with God his friend and father, so we have a position where we can hear every day. Not just at those times when we want a direction, but we can hear every day. Of course, it's really important for those big times when you've got marriage or career change or your moving location. I call those signpost times. You know, you're on a journey and you get to the end of the road and then it says go left, go right, don't go over here, it's a no entry. Sometimes you're in that signpost place where you need to hear and you need the direction. And God can be like that with us. And we need that. We need that. We need to have that word of God to stand on. Because if things go wrong and you don't know you're where God wants you to be, then you're just going to get frustrated and, and lose all hope. But when you know you're where God wants you to be and things go wrong, you know that God has a plan for it. So there are the signpost times, but there's the other part of this relationship with God where he wants you to walk with him. He wants you to get up in the morning and say, good morning, Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning, Father God. Good morning, Jesus. Another day with you. What do you want to tell me today? Amen. What have you got to say to me today? Because my ears are inclined. I want to hear. I want to know what you're saying. I want to be in love with you. We just sung the room said, I'm coming back to the heart of worship. Yeah. That freshness. I want to know what you're saying to me because you've got something you want to tell me today. I was thinking about the reasons why some people might not be hearing, can we have the next slide, why some people might not be hearing the voice of God. I don't know if that's very clear. But you know, sometimes you're not hearing God because he's already spoken to you yeah. and you have missed it. Yeah. He said something to you and you've been listening but not hearing, you've missed what he's saying. That's right. Sometimes you're not hearing God's voice. Because um, you, you're hearing nothing from God. Sometimes you're not hearing anything from God, but that nothing from God is his answer to you. Sometimes when he says nothing, that's not a no answer, that's a yes answer. I'm not saying anything, it's my answer to you. I'm being silent. Maybe it's being, it's being silent to you because he's told you to do something like repair a broken relationship and you just don't want to do it. You want to move on past point number one. You want to go to point number two. Because sometimes God's silence is his answer to you. Sometimes we don't like what God said to us. We don't like it. I don't like that rebuke, God. Yeah, I'm just going to push that one aside. Say something else to me. Say something nice. But you know if God rebukes you, because he loves you, it's always for your best. Sometimes we're not hearing from God because we're standing in the wrong position. If you're in a crowded room and you're trying to talk, but say, I'm trying to talk to Bunny or Andrew over there and everyone's talking, it's the end of the service and I'm just saying, <laughs> he's not going to be able to hear me because there's too much distraction, there's too much other noise. You want to hear from someone. Take him for a coffee. Go aside. Call him over to you. Be close. Sometimes you can't hear God. 
because you're in the wrong position. I think Mike might sometimes want to be in the wrong position so he doesn't have to hear me. Anyway. <laughs> what did I say? There you go. You know, sometimes we are talking too much. <laughs> yeah, that's me. Yeah. I do, I talk too, sometimes I'm talking too much. <laughs> Maybe it's a ladies thing. Yeah. We seem to communicate with each other, the women, with the women well, don't we? Yeah. But sometimes we're talking too much, but the Bible tells us, be swift to hear and be slow to speak. We need to learn to be good listeners. James 1 verse 19 to 20. Let everyone be quick to hear. Be a careful and a thoughtful listener. You know, sometimes people can be talking to you. And even sometimes you're not really listening to what someone's saying. And we can be like that with God. That he's talking to us but we're not really taking in what he's saying. But we need to be... Realising we're always on this journey of learning, always on this journey of hearing something new, always on this journey of getting more information. Sometimes I think it's like that on the streets when people go out evangelising. You know, Jesus said, I came to draw people to myself. And sometimes you get some people that, that go and interrogate someone with the gospel. Hell and bring a stone. It's like an interrogation. But you know, sometimes we need to give people time. We don't want to go on the streets to, to win the argument. We want to go on the streets or evangelism in our office, wherever it will be. We want to go to win a soul. Forget the arguments. Don't go for the argument. Go for the soul. Go to, to reach that person and they might need you to listen to them. Because I think with evangelism, sometimes we're ready to give the message. You know, God might just be bringing that soul along so that you listen. And when you begin to speak into their life and you begin to give them the love of God, that's when God draws them to himself. Because they begin to have their eyes open and you need to speak love and truth and listen to their hearts. That's why I'm so glad God does that with us. You know, when Jesus was with, with the two disciples on the Emmaus Road after his death and he was walking along and they were having a discussion about all that happened and he began to explain the scriptures. He began to open up his word. He made his word alive. He didn't go to the rituals and the commands. He just began to explain how it all happens. And as he did that, the disciples' hearts were warmed and they felt something really real burning inside of them. You speak God's word in love. You speak the truth. You bring revelation. That's all we're to do. We're to bring revelation. We're to reveal what's happening. That's what brings a change to circumstances and to other people. Sometimes God's answer is sitting right next to us. You know, God's written us the most amazing love letter. Took time over it. Put his heart and soul into this message. The biggest, loveliest, longest love letter that anyone's ever written. He took the time to write it for you and me, but like in my house, dust accumulates. We can pick up our Bible and there's dust all over our Bible because it's never been moved. And that love letter is sitting there you're not interested in what God had to say. And then you say, tell me something else. But have you read my love letter? And maybe you find it hard to read the Bible. I've got some sheets here on my chair. If, you, if you're struggling and you can't get into this love letter, then come and ask me, I'll show you which the easier chapters are to start with. Because God wants us to incline our ear to hear. I go over the reasons why Christians no longer read their Bibles. First, it could be because they can't get past Genesis. Or they think it's boring. I can't understand it. It's, it makes my mind go. I don't even know if it's true. Some things don't end up in the Word of God. It can be because we're undisciplined or we don't have time. Or it can be because we just don't want to read it. I'd rather do anything else, but don't tell me to read the Bible. 
And maybe you struggle with reading. Then can you all can say we're spoiled. We're spoiled in this generation. We can have it on and we can listen to it without having to read it. You know, Mike sent me a clip, a video clip on my phone. I couldn't open it. I don't know if it's down to me or down to Mike. And he said to me, did you see that? And I said, no, what was it? Because I've still not been able to open it. But you know, the clip was about someone going on the streets and speaking to people passing by. And he went up to Christians, anyone that said they were Christian, and said to them, can you give me two verses? Can you just speak to me about two verses? And give me two verses in the Bible. And most people that said they were Christians couldn't. None of them? None of them could. And then he went to the Muslims. And he said, can you give me two verses from the Quran? And every single Muslim, all of them could give two verses from the Quran. It's a genuine concern in this day and age and generation that we do not know the word God. Praise God for the pastor here that knows the word and can quote it. But we need to make sure we know what the word says because even reading it from other people or Googling things, that can be misleading. It might not be the truth. It might be a wrong impression of something. I found it really interesting. At the end of Revelation, the very end of the Bible, the third from the end verse, Revelation 22, 18 to 19, this is what God finished all of that big love letter off with. He said, if I warn anyone, I want everyone who hears the word of the prophecy of this scroll. If anyone adds to my word, God will add to that person the plagues described in the scroll. And if anyone takes words from the scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in the scroll. God does not want people to add or take away from his love letter. He doesn't want people to twist it because he wants to make sure you know what he wants to say. He doesn't want us to be led astray. You know, in Psalms and in Habakkuk, 70 more times the word sailor or sealer, I don't know quite how you say it, but it appears there. And sometimes you don't have to read the whole long chapter and think I've done it. It's better sometimes just to read a little and to meditate and let that drip into you. And that's what that word means in the Psalms. Sailor means pause, consider, think about what you've just read. You could just read a couple of verses, but when you break it down and look into it, it makes such an impact on your life. You know, God's saying, I'm your shield, I will answer your cry. Oh yeah, God's going to answer my cry. But when you really think about that, I am your shield. And when you take that in, that's when you really are hearing it and not just listening to it. But the enemy does not want us to really get past that first point. God longs for fellowship. He wants to give signs and directions, but his ultimate is fellowship with every single believer. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. You know, there's enough religions. There's enough people doing good works. There's enough people wanting to do duty. There's enough people who wanting to stand in a position. But what God wants is for us to spend time with him. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God. And he will draw near to you. Do you want to be near to God? you want to be touched by God? you want intimacy? Or do you just want him to oh, do your signpost, God? He doesn't just want to be a signpost. He wants intimacy. He wants your time. It doesn't have to be long. But just give him ten minutes a day. Put it in your diary. My ten minutes with God. Henry Blackaby said, the more you know God, next, next slide, the more you know God, the more clearly you can hear him. The more you know him, the more clearly you are going to hear him. God always sought to be amongst people from the very beginning, coming to the Garden of Eden to meet with Adam and Eve, getting a tabernacle in the midst of the people so he could come and presence himself with them. Moving to the temple so that he could have a permanent dwelling place amongst his people. Then he came, Jesus himself came down to earth to be with people. 
He comes to where we are. He comes down to you and me. You know, it's like a big staircase and you're looking up and thinking, I'm never going to get up there. And then Jesus says, don't worry. You don't have to reach here on your own. I'm going to come down to earth and I'm going to go step by step by step to take you to where I am. I'm coming down to take you to where I am. The passage that God's given me for this year, and this is really revelationary to me, having looked at it, is Samuel, the story of Samuel. You know the little boy Samuel when he went to, and Hannah prayed for him, and then she got Samuel, and then she went to the temple, and she promised God, if you give me a child, I'm going to give that child back to you. Samuel was a child with a, a promise, and these are the verses. And we're going to look at this, and we're going to read it, but we're just going to go through the verses bit by bit. 1 Samuel 3. Verse 1a, the boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. This is what I mean about breaking down something God's saying. You get so much revelation from it. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. Samuel had a promise over his life. He'd been given to be in the temple from a young age. I think it was only three when he went to start ministering in the temple. Because it was around the age of 12 when he got this encounter with God. But he put himself under Eli. One of the key things to really growing and changing and developing well is to put yourself under good leadership. Put yourself in a position of good leadership. They will help you build yourself up in godly ways. You know, Mike and I, we, we grew up in a really good church. We put ourselves under good leadership. I didn't just choose a church easily. Um, even as a 14-year-old, I, I really sought out the church God was leading me to. And then we went from there, we went to a Bible college. And again, we didn't just put your hand down and put your finger on a college and go there. We asked God to lead us. Because we knew it was key for our lives to be able to fulfill God's call for us to be under good leadership. We went abroad, we left our home church, we went abroad for I think five years or so. And then when we came back, because our church in Dartford, we came from where our church was, they supported us so well that we tied six months just to do whatever they asked us to do before we started our ministry here in London. Friends, you really wanna hear from God? Put yourself under good leaders. And we move on in the story of 1 Samuel, verse uh, 1, B part, second part, says, In those days the Lord, word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. I said to you, sometimes silence is God's answer to us. Times when he is not speaking. Times when we're not hearing breakthrough in our life. If I'm not talking to Mike, there's going to be a really good reason for it, and vice versa. <laughs> it's not for nothing we're not going to talk, is it, huh? <laughs> oh, I'm going to leave you. Not leave you, but leave you in this time. <laughs> You've been there sat there, haven't you? But if we're not talking, we're not communicating, it's a reason we're not communicating. If God's not communicating, and he's not speaking, and he's silent, there's a reason for that silence. I said silence is God speaking to us. He's trying to, sell, to say something to us. Do you know, maybe there's a promise we've made to God and we've not honoured it. Maybe we've forgotten the promise we promised God. God never forgets a single promise that you made to him. He will hold you accountable for the times you answer an appeal. Or the time you said you was going to do something. God will hold that. He uses our promises to get an angle and get a grip on our life. To take us to where we really need to be. So maybe we can answer the promise. But you know, between the Old Testament and the New Testament, there was a silence. There were about 400 years of God not speaking. Just as there was a silence in the time of Samuel working under Eli. And it's got to become silent because you know in a love relationship, if one person's not giving energy and not putting in, 
And someone keeps lavishing love. In the end, that person lavishing love will want to draw away. They'll want to draw back. And God was trying to give love to the Israelites. And they didn't want to listen to him. And it got to the awful point where they actually started blaming God for everything that was going wrong in their life. God, you've not spoken. You've not intervened. And they started to blame God. But you know, God's never sitting idle. In those 400 years, when there was nothing said between the Old Testament and the New Testament, many, many prophecies were actually fulfilled in those years. God is always working. He might be silent, but behind the scenes there's always something going wrong. You know, in all those years, the Romans, they were building roads in, in, in the area where the, Jew, in the Jews were. And it was those roads that the Romans were building, which saved the, Jew, saved the Jews doing it, those roads that the Romans were building at the time of the Acts church. They gave easy access for the gospel to go forth and for the church to grow. They made use of what the Romans were doing. You know, maybe God's doing something in the scenes we're not realising, allowing us not to have to build the roads, but letting someone else do the work for us and we reap the benefits. God is always doing something. He gives silence for a time and opportunity to hear from him. If you can put up slide 14. I've thrown this before. You're not hearing God speak. You don't even have to go to the mountain. You can see it on the internet. You're not hearing God speak. You're not seeing who God is. You're not knowing what he paints and how he thinks and what he wants to do. You're not seeing... What he's saying? Sit and look. Open your eyes. Creation speaks. You sit there. You can just rest and reflect and let God speak to you afresh. In that stillness, in that quietness, let God speak. Because he has something he wants to say. Silence speaks. Silence in music speaks. You know that moment in the play or something when everything goes still and it makes you think, oh, something's coming. Something's coming. There's a pause. There's a sailor. There's a, a pause of quietness. God speaks through his silence. And we need to listen seriously to what he's saying. There's another silence that's going to come in Revelation 8 verse 1. When the Lamb opens the seventh seal, there will be silence in heaven. For about half an hour. Now maybe that's not literal half an hour. And I wonder why God would bring a silence at that time. And I think straight after that is the outpouring of God's judgment. And I wonder if he brings a silence just before he pours out his judgment. Hoping that in the silence that some people will yet turn to him. Because he doesn't want anyone to be destroyed. And he goes silent. Silence in heaven, hoping that in the silence, when he's been trying to speak and trying to break in, hoping in the silence, in that last moment, the people yet hear his voice. We should listen to God when God speaks. But when he stops speaking, that's when we should really pay attention. There was silence in the time of Eli. You know, 1 Samuel 3, 2 says, One night Eli, whose eyes were becoming weak, and he could barely see. He was lying down in his usual place. Sometimes you get old, and you've been in the ministry for so long, you're not even bothered about it anymore. You're not bothered about God. He doesn't interest you anymore. You've heard it all. There's nothing new. Nothing coming. Nothing fresh. That's what Eli got to. God spoke to him, he told him things to do, but oh my goodness, this duty is just getting too much. He says he was lying down in his usual place. Where was that? Where's our usual place? Is it the place God wants us to be? Are you still excited to be in the house of God? I found it interesting in the Revelation churches, Ephesus was a lo uh, loveless church. Smyrna was the persecuted church, Pergamon the worldly church, Thyatira the wrong doctrine church, Sardis the spiritually dead church, Philadelphia the spiritually alive church, Laodicea the lukewarm church. All different things that needed to be corrected. But there was one thing in common. 
common with all those churches. They were given what they should do. But one thing that was in common for all those churches, the conclusion of every letter to all those churches said the same thing again and again and again. It said, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the church. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Because I've sent my message, I've sent the letter. But if you don't hear it and you don't respond to it, you don't do what it's saying, there's no point to send you a love letter or a correction letter because it's for your good. I want you to be with me. Go back to our story in Samuel 1, Samuel 3, verse 3 to 4. says, The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord. This young boy, 12 years old, working under Eli, who was instructing him in duty, but hadn't revealed to Samuel that you can have a personal encounter with God. This young boy, 12 years old, was lying down in the house of the Lord. And I've just said to you that Samuel was lying, sorry, Eli was lying in his usual place. But Samuel, he lay down in the house of the Lord. Young boy, where the ark of God was. Samuel didn't want to be in a usual place. He wanted to be near the ark of God. He wanted to be doing what he's supposed to be doing. And then, then, then when your position is correct, then when you're drawing close, then. And I can see people sleeping. Are you hearing? Or are you listening? Then the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel said, here I am. If you are drawing close, if you are standing where God wants you to be, then you're going to hear what God wants to say. Samuel was in his correct position. Sometimes we've got to change our position to hear from God. Maybe get out of the crowd and go and get along with him. Maybe take God for a coffee and just sit there with your Bible. Say, God, I've got your letter. I want to communicate with you. I want you to speak to me. But for Samuel, for Samuel, he got then the call of God. Because he was in the right position. He was near to God. Whereas Eli had gone afar off. Doesn't matter who you are. God has no favourites. He's just looking for someone that wants to spend time with him. 1 Samuel 3 verse 5. And Samuel runs to Eli and says, here I am. You called me. And Eli said, oh, I didn't call you. Yeah. You know, Samuel was doing the most mundane jobs. We heard it today. He was doing the most mundane jobs. He was a young boy. People didn't give him much time and attention. He was running around after people. He was eager to serve Eli any time Eli called. Samuel was giving the menial jobs. But he wasn't complaining. He was just happy because he knew he had an anointing upon his life and he was going to stay in the position that God had for him. He was just happy because he knew that God had given him that position. He knew he was valued. He knew he was important. We don't need to get our identity in our job. Luke 16, 10 says, One who is faithful in little will also be faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in little is also dishonest in much. It doesn't say God's going to give you more when you're faithful. It says if you learn in your character to be faithful, even if you're given a menial job to do in the kingdom of God, then when you get to do bigger things, you're going to have that strength, the character, to also be faithful in a greater thing. David said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God. You know, a doorkeeper was the contemptible office. Being a doorkeeper, it belonged to the common Levites. But David would rather be a doorkeeper because he just wanted to be in the house of God than to be somewhere else. And I'm sure that Samuel knew his calling and he knew his identity and it, it didn't matter. He just wanted to be near where God was. Even Joseph, you remember Joseph, he went through so much. And it wasn't about him getting the big position. Because of God, the greatest in the kingdom is the servant of all. It was about Joseph learning heart. It was about Joseph learning to get rid of his pride. It was about Joseph learning that I have nothing of myself, only if God puts me there. Samuel runs to Eli. And Eli responds to Samuel, I did not call you, go back. And Samuel lays down again and then he hears a call again. Comes back. Eli, you called me. And Eli said, I didn't call you. 
1 Samuel 3 verse 7 says, Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of God had not yet been revealed to him. Isn't it sad that you can be so long, right in the centre of the place God meets people, and actually miss it altogether? Because it's just duty. Oh, I've got to go and worship. Oh, I've got to do Sunday school. Oh, I've got to stand on the door. Oh, I've got to serve the coffee. Oh, I've got to do this. Oh, I've got to do that. Oh, I've got to do this. And it becomes mundane. And it becomes duty. Samuel was trained in duty, but he wasn't trained that there's a relationship with a God that's passionate. Oh, why? Because the man he was working under, Eli, had lost that relationship with God. Being a Christian shouldn't be boring. Shouldn't be duty. It should be exciting. I'm a kid, child of the Most High King. Miracles, signs, wonders, breakthrough, deliverance. Someone who's with me to the end. Wouldn't swap it for the world. Wouldn't swap that relationship for the world. And God says he wants to make everything known to us. So he wasn't bothered about being in duty because he knew if God had put him there, he just wanted to do what God had given him to do. Sometimes we can be so close and yet so far. We can jump to slide 26. 1 Samuel 3, verse 8 to 9. A third time God called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. And it was then. Can you see that word then? I've underlined it. Then, finally, the third time, a priest who's supposed to know God. It was after the third time that suddenly Eli's thinking, Well, maybe God's moving again. Maybe God's doing something. You can be so long and, and doing everything. But what makes a difference is God speaking. What makes a difference is doing God breaks in. And then Eli says, Samuel, go and lie down again. And if he calls you. He wasn't even expecting God to speak. Oh, might be a chance God calls you. If he calls you, then say, speak, Lord. Mm -hmm. He had doubt. He didn't even trust that God was going to do anything anymore. So sad. So Samuel goes and lays down 1 Samuel 3, 10 to 11. And I love this. Next, uh, next clip. And the Lord came and stood there. This time, God's not just shouting. He's seen someone that's hearing. And he comes and stands there. And he stands next to Samuel. And he called us other times. And we'd say sometimes God called him three times. No. He went, Samuel, Samuel. He kept calling. If God wants to get a message to you, be sure that he's going to keep calling. You're going to hear the same message from different sources, different people, verses in the Bible, preachings you listen to. When God wants to speak to you, he's going to get that word through. There's no coincidences in the kingdom of God. And he heard Samuel, Samuel, four times, five times. And then I love that, that verse at the end. It's in 21, I think. It says, Samuel said, speak for your servant is hearing. And then God said. There he revealed to Samuel his words. The slide 27. See, I'm about to do something new in Israel that will make the ears of everybody that hears about it tingle. It came through Samuel, the 12-year-old boy, doing the menial jobs. But loving God and being near the ark. He slept near the ark. He slept near the presence. He stayed where God was. He didn't come through Eli where it should have come through. Then God says to Samuel, I'm going to do something new in Israel. The ears are going to tingle. And he starts to speak his heart to Samuel. That's what he wants with you and me. He doesn't want just your prayers of, can you give me this? Can you give me more money? Can you ask my prayer? He wants to tell you what he wants to do. He wants someone to be interested in what he wants to do. And slide 28, the Lord continued to appear. The Lord continued to appear because there was someone that was listening. Someone that wanted to hear. God wants to come to us again and again and again and again. But we need to learn, as Eli did, that word there says he discerned it might be the Lord. He discerned, he realised, he understood it might be God. And we need to learn and realise and understand when God's voice is trying to speak to us. And he's speaking to every single person in this room. He has something to say to you, not just about you, but he wants to reveal things to you. When did we last sit down and say, God, I'm here, tell me something you want to do. God, I'm here, tell me what's on your heart. God, I'm here, what do you say, what do you want, what do you want from me, here I am. That's what Samuel did. We need to 
just learn to understand God's voice. You know, my daughter Grace, I think most of you know my Micah. <laughs> my daughter Grace, she's blind. I think most of you know that. She can't see who people are. And if someone doesn't say their name, she has to listen and try and recognize whose voice it is. She knows people by listening. You will know God by listening because the more you practice, the more you incline your ear, the more you're going to hear. What well, His voice is the voice of other, other voices, the one you want to listen to, the one you want to hear from. And God can speak long. He can speak long. He always spoke long with Samuel. And God can also speak short. I said on the leaders retreat, let there be light. Four words of God. And suddenly the worlds were there. Suddenly creation was there. Let there be light. Sometimes we're too wordy. And people miss what's trying to be said. But you sometimes just do four short words. And when God says short words, even to you, let there be light created a world. God's word is always powerful. And will always accomplish what it's sent forth to do. It will do miracles. It will do wonders. It will do signs in your lives and other lives. Slide 30. I love this saying from Bob Sword. She says, things don't change when I talk to God. Things change, gets changed when God talks to me. God wants to talk to us. He wants to break in. Let's keep looking for our signposts, but let's give God some time. Let's go fellowship with God. Let's give him that time. I haven't got time now, because time's gone. But you know, my whole life, and the one thing I'm really grateful for, above all the things that went wrong in my life, and all the difficulties I've had, the one thing I will ever be grateful to God for, is I've heard his voice. When we started out, Mike and I, in a relationship, I prayed. We prayed together. Do you want us together, God? We like each other. Do you want us together? And God said, love ministry. A few weeks in, God said, love ministry. I'm calling you two together to a love ministry. Didn't know what that meant. We wanted to start our ministry somehow. We, God can speak through giving a, a, a thought or something in your mind. And a, and a, and a few years in, we wanted to start somehow. We had our holidays booked from the bank for the summer. And we were looking, where can we start? Where is there an opportunity for us to go and minister? And there was one outreach going on with a team called Action Europe that exactly fitted the dates we had booked at the bank. And sometimes God will speak to you through circumstance. When I went to this outreach and, and saw these people from Holland, the way they ministered and what they did with God, I just, something burned inside me. I want a part of that. I want a part of this. Like, that's where I see God working. I want to be where they are because they are going to ignite me. I want to be under their leadership. Sometimes God gives you a burning inside when he's speaking. I was so nervous when I'd be moved to the area office and only been there one year in the West End. So nervous as how I was leaving because no one leaves the West End office. You know all the managers of that West Bank all over central London. When he with knees knocking to tell the manager, thank you for the opportunity, but I'm going to be leaving this job. I knew that he was kind of a lay preacher. He turned around and said to me, Jackie, if God's called you, you go. If God's telling you to leave the bank, go. Just follow what God's got for your life. I'm like, my goodness, that's not confirmation. God will speak to you through confirmation. When Mike and I were choosing, deciding to get married, I tell your friends, don't marry someone that's not equal with you. Don't just marry someone because they believe. Mike believed, I believed. Don't marry ever someone that just believes. You have to know that God has a plan for you together, that God can use you together in ministry and stand on that rather than not get married. We were prepared to break up at one point for a year. Because we hadn't got the go ahead in God. You're yoked together in marriage. And, and sometimes you're married with an unbeliever. If that's so, then stay and bless and pray for that partner. But if you've got the choice, look for someone that you can serve God with. Because it will hamper your ministry. You'll be putting that person before God. Put God first. Yeah. I can go on and on. You know, we come to start the bank, uh, come to start the church. Glad to start bank. 
come to start the church. And we've been trying for a year, knocking, knocking, knocking on doors. No one was wanting us to come and work with them. And then we got introduced after we'd left our house, after we packed up our belongings, after we'd given notice to our landlord to move from Brixton to central London. We didn't have a house, we didn't have anywhere to go. And we were asking God, you know, sometimes God speaks in the 59th minute of the hour. You wish he'd come five minutes after the clock, but he waits for the very last minute. In that last month of being packed up with Misha, bless her, playing amongst the boxes, no toys out. Not knowing where to go or what to do. But we knew God had called us to central London in that last month. We got introduced to someone that wanted to start a church but didn't feel to pastor it. But he said, God, show me white pastors are going to come in and build it and take this church on. In that last month, we got introduced. We met him. We went to start a church with someone we didn't know. How do you ever do that? And we're going, God, we need to know you're speaking. We went back over our promise book because when people give us things, we write it down. And this man was a black man, and there was a, a scripture, a, a, a prophecy given to us that in the future you're going to be starting a ministry with a black man. That's how this church started. Someone we didn't know, we started a church with. The day we pulled up to start the church, the first service, parked under a, a sign saying flat to let. We've been trying to find a flat for a year. Parked under this sign. Let's ask on Monday, because it was Sunday. Two weeks later, we moved in. Sometimes God speaks in the last minute, but make sure God's speaking. Sometimes God speaks through angels. I've once had an angel encounter. That's why I say God's exciting. I was really in a bad place. I was walking down the road, and this person walking towards me late at night, person said to me, cheer up, might never happen. And I walked past them, and I thought, that's so rude. And I turned around, and there was no one there. And it was a road, you, no side road, nowhere you can disappear to. There was no one there. And I'm like, God, have I just encountered an angel? And their words, cheer up, it might never happen, have stayed with me to that day. Don't think the worst, it might never happen. And go to slide 31. Ways God want to speak to us and come into a close. Through his word, give revelation, his love letter. Through creation, through a still small voice. Slide 33. Peace gives you that inner witness. He speaks through circumstances. He hems you in. Nothing's happening. God's silent. But maybe it's God hemming you in because he doesn't want you to go the wrong direction. Through sermons, through dreams. I don't often dream, but when I do, I really take note and write it down. Through vision. You might see a vision. Many, many ways. Slide 34. The audible voice. I've heard a couple of times, not often. Angelic vegetation, which I said, prophetic words. Sometimes people will give you a prophetic word, receive it, but, ju but don't just act on it. I want, to, I want you to be careful with prophetic words. I give prophetic words. But make sure it lines up with other things. Because people are fallible. And we are to test when a word's given. The Bible says when a word's given in the church, it says the church to weigh it up and think, is that really God? Because people are going to want to speak into your life. They're going to want to tell you things. But they're still people. And yes, I'm sure they're hearing from God. But make sure you get a scripture to back it up. I love that we have the Holy Nation worship nights. Because God is moving in those nights. And words are flowing. Write it down. Mark it down what God says. But let God add to it to confirm it. You know, when an airplane's coming into land, it doesn't just look for one light on the runway, thank goodness. It looks for a long line of lights. And then it's okay, this is where I've got to go. Look for the long line of, light, of lights. Safeguard yourself. I love this picture, slide 35. This is how it was for the Israelites. They all pitched their tents facing the presence. They all pitched their tents facing the presence. That's where our house should be, facing God. Having God in the centre of our life. Focusing on if he's going to move. And they didn't just move camp. They waited to hear the trumpet sounding. They waited to see the cloud lifting. They waited to see the way open. You're looking for God to speak about something specific. Asking for more than one sign. Just to be sure. It's not that you're doubting. 
But it's you really need to know. We're going to hear that still small voice when we turn to the left and we turn to the right. We should be hearing that voice. If we're listening, if we're inclining that ear, and if we're hearing. I want to give a gift this year, and I'm very grateful to Vicky who's helped me make it. Somebody, I've had some lovely presents for my birthday earlier in the year, and some handmade things which I always treasure. And I always keep my handmade cards or gifts stored away at my house, I never get rid of them. And you know who you are, those of you especially that made handmade gifts to me. But one person gave me this that they made. Oh. Took a long time, I was saving that. No. Oh. Got things inside it for me to draw upon. I just didn't know how prophetic that was going to be for my word for the new year. Because this year, I want to give you homework. I know you get a lot of homework from Mike, and I don't want to add to that. <laughs> but I want to give you all homework. And Vicky helped me make these. It's a book, and it says incline your ear. Now this isn't a book to write down every week's sermons. It's not a book to study and just keep writing and writing in it. You can do that in other books. This is a very specific book. I want you to take this book, and you can add in it words that God's spoken to you about your life in the past. But I want to challenge you to incline your ear this year, to hear God saying specific things to you about your life. And if it gives you a word and you want it confirmed, wait till the confirmation comes and write in here. Because this is going to be like your instruction booklet. Amen. This is what you're going to draw upon when things go wrong. And maybe God speaks every day to you. And maybe God speaks once every couple of months to you. Write it in here. Write it in here. And don't forget what God's saying. Don't forget maybe you want to write an answer prayer. Don't forget what God's saying. Make a note. Of God's word to you. Hallelujah. And this year, let's incline our ear. God bless you all. Amen.